Hi class, today we're going to be talking about non-parametric tests of significance, specifically the chi-square. The significant tests that we've been talking about so far, the t-tests and ANOVA, are parametric tests. Parametric tests assume normally distributed data and interval level data. If data are not normally distributed, or if you are dealing with data that is exclusively nominal or ordinal, these tests aren't really useful. So given when you have skewed or non-normal, or nominal slash ordinal data, which is also referred to as categorical data, researchers must use non-parametric tests of significance. As a reminder, these are the types of data and levels of measurement. You have nominal and ordinal data, which are categorical in nature, and you have interval and ratio data, which are continuous in nature. When we were speaking about the t-tests in ANOVA, we were focused on interval data. Today, we're going to be talking about an analysis that you can do when you have nominal or ordinal data. Nonparametric statistics is based on either being distribution theory, in that case, categorical data, or having a specified distribution, but with the distribution's, par distribution's parameters unspecified. So that would be skewed or non-normal data. So some disadvantages of non-parametric tests is that because they do not assume normality of data, they are less powerful tests of significance. Therefore, you're more likely to be able to reject the null with the t-test or in the ANOVA. So those are the ones that you would want to use as much as possible. However, if you have skewed data or if you have non-continuous data, there's nothing you can do about it and you need to use non-parametric statistics. Therefore, today I'm going to teach you a couple of different types of statistics that are non-parametric that you can utilize in research studies. The ones that we're going to be talking about today are the chi-square tests, specifically the one-way chi-square tests and the two-way chi-square tests. So there's more than just these two. There's more different types of non-parametric tests of significance, but these are the ones that are used most often, and therefore these are the ones that we are going to cover as part of this class. The chi-square test is used to determine whether there's a significant difference between the expected frequencies and the observed frequencies in categorical data. So with chi-squares, you essentially compare the observed frequencies, or what you obtained as part of your research, and you can compare it to the expected frequencies. So the frequencies that are expected to occur based on probability theory, or that they are expected to occur based on the literature review out there thus far. And so when you test those differences, the more that observed differences differ from expected frequencies, the more likely it is that your research hypothesis is true and that you can reject the null. So here's a one-way chi-square video that I would like us to watch. Let's look at chi-square tests for one-way tables. In a one-way table, observations are classified according to a single categorical variable. For example, in a study of blood types, a sample of 100 individuals might reveal the following table. Here we have 43 individuals with blood type O and so on. Blood type is a categorical variable. Each individual falls into one and only one of these four categories. And we might be interested in testing a hypothesis about the distribution of blood types. So, for example, somebody might contend that these four blood types are equally likely, and we might want to see if this sample gives strong evidence against that claim. The example we're going to work through is a famous genetics experiment in 1905 that investigated inheritance in sweet peas. In this experiment, one pure line of peas that had purple flowers and long pollen grains was crossed with another pure line that had red flowers and round pollen grains. This first generation was then self-crossed. Here are the results for the resulting 381 plants. There are four possible phenotypes. The phenotype is simply the observed characteristics of the plant. And we had 281 plants that had purple flowers and long pollen grains, 21 that had purple flowers and round pollen grains, 21 that had red flowers and long pollen grains, and 55 that had red flowers and round pollen grains. Genetics theory tells us that if these two genes are inherited independently, a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio would be expected. 
And if you want more information on that, do an internet search of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1, and a lot of information will come up. We're going to test the null hypothesis that the true ratio of those four phenotypes is 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. Or in other words, those two genes are being inherited independently. The alternative hypothesis is going to be that that is simply not the case. The true ratio is not this, and those genes are not being inherited independently. We could write this null hypothesis out a little bit differently, in terms of probabilities of the different categories. This 9 represents purple flowers and long pollen grains, and so we could write out that the null hypothesis is that the probability of getting a plant with purple flowers and long pollen grains is 9 out of 16, 9 out of the 16 total, and so on for the other four categories. And we are asking ourselves this question. Are the counts observed in the sample significantly different from those expected under the null hypothesis? Here again are our probabilities under the null hypothesis, and we're going to use these to get our expected counts, what we would expect to see in each of those categories on average if the null hypothesis were true. And we're going to get that by multiplying these hypothesized probabilities by our total sample size. We had 381 plants, so I'm multiplying that by my hypothesized probability here, and I get 214.3. So if the null hypothesis were true, I would expect to get, on average, 214.3 plants with purple flowers and long pollen grains. And I'm simply going to do this for the rest of them. Multiply by the total sample size. Here I get 71.4. The same thing in this third category, of course. And for the last one, we're going to get 23.8. So these are our expected counts under the null hypothesis. Now I've rounded it off to one decimal place there, but in these chi-square tests you should typically carry many decimal places throughout the calculations. Here again are the observed counts from the sample, and the expected counts under the null hypothesis. Over here in this category we actually saw 284 plants with purple flowers and long pollen grains. But if the null hypothesis were true, we would expect to see, on average, only 214.3. And over here for red flowers and round pollen grains, we saw 55, but we would expect to see, under the null hypothesis, only 23.8. The difference between the observed counts and the expected counts seem quite large to my eye, but we're going to go ahead and carry out a formal test of the hypothesis. The test statistic is going to be a chi-square test statistic where for each cell, we take what we saw in the sample, we subtract what we would expect to get in that cell on average if the null hypothesis were true, square it, divide it by the expected count, and then add it up over all cells. If the null hypothesis is true, this test statistic is going to have approximately a chi-square distribution. Under certain conditions, and loosely speaking, those conditions are that we have a large enough sample size. For one-way tables, the degrees of freedom are the number of cells minus 1, or in other words, the number of categories we have minus 1. If we take another look at this test statistic, note that if the observed counts are close to the expected counts, then the test statistic is going to be small. And if the observed counts are very different from the expected counts, well, then the test statistic is going to be large. And so large values of the test statistic give us evidence against the null hypothesis. For a given degrees of freedom, the greater the value of the test statistic, the greater the evidence against the null hypothesis. And so when we go to get our p-value, we are simply going to take the observed value of our test statistic, so I'm going to call this the observed value of the test statistic, and the p-value is going to be the probability under the null hypothesis of getting that value or something even larger. Or in other words, the area to the right of our test statistic under a chi-square distribution with the appropriate degrees of freedom. Here again is our table of observed and expected counts. And let's take a look at this purple and long category again. We had 284 actually observed in the sample 
and under the null hypothesis we'd expect to see 214.3 on average. To construct our chi-square test statistic, for each cell we take the observed count, subtract the expected count, square that, and then divide by the expected. So this cell has this contribution to the chi-square test statistic, and we do that for all four of the cells, and then we simply add it up. Overall, we get a chi-square test statistic value of 134.7. Now we need to see how large of a chi-square test statistic that is. We want to get the appropriate p-value. To do so, we need the degrees of freedom. So our degrees of freedom in these one-way tables are simply the number of cells minus one. Here we had one, two, three, four categories, four cells. We had these four terms that we were adding up, so the degrees of freedom are simply 4 minus 1, which is 3. Here I've plotted out the chi-square distribution with 3 degrees of freedom and the observed value of our test statistic. The p-value is the probability of getting this value or something even farther out to the right if the null hypothesis is actually true. So the p-value is simply the area to the right of our test statistic. As we can probably see just looking at this distribution, the p-value is tiny here. The p-value is very, very small and very, very close to zero. Because the p-value is very, very small and very close to zero, there is very, very strong evidence against the null hypothesis. In this case, that means there is extremely strong evidence that these phenotypes do not occur in a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. And in fact, this study was important in the discovery of genetic linkage, where genes close to each other on the same chromosome are more likely to be inherited together. So sometimes the statistical methods discussed in an introductory statistics course can help with some very important discoveries. So some examples of when you might use chi-square is you might use it as a first test to be conducted. So if you know little about the relationship between two variables, then it might be wise to conduct a chi-square test just to see whether there's any relationship or not. It's also good to see how a sample closely matches a population, aka this is called the goodness of fit, which is the extent to which observed data match the values expected by theory. And then also, of course, like I've said before, it's good to use if your sample is not normally distributed or has categorical data. So here's a practical example of a one-way um, chi-square analysis. So the table below lists the observed frequencies and the expected frequencies um, below, uh, below. So there are 39 students in an English class, and because there are six different categories or majors right here, six different categories, psychology, counseling, human services, neuroscience, etc. The instructor would expect by chance that there would be equal number of students in, uh, in each major. So um, that is, if there was no relationship between the English course and the students that were taking the course, then we would expect there to be equal numbers of students from each major taking the course. So here we have equal number of students divided up between the majors. So the null hypothesis is there's no difference in expected observed values. So in this case, it would be majors are equally divided in the English course. So the expected hypothesis. And then the research hypothesis is that there is a difference in expected and observed values. So majors are not equally divided in the English course. So the research hypothesis speaks to the observed and the ex null hypothesis speaks to the expected. So there's also a two-way chi-square analysis, and this has the same execution as the one-way, but allows us to answer more layered or complex research questions. It also allows us to compare multiple observed frequencies against a theoretical expected distribution. So um, like the last example in terms of enrollment by majors, here's our majors still, so that's still our 
um, our variable, but we also have another variable here. We have this sex, the male and female. So a two-way chi-square analysis allows us to look more in-depth in terms of our observed and our expected frequencies. So let's watch a video on the two-way chi-square. Let's talk about chi-square tests for two-way tables, sometimes referred to as chi-square tests of independence. Let's open with an example. A study of 11,160 alcohol drinkers on university campuses revealed the information in this table. Here there's two categorical variables. The variable in the columns is binge drinking, whether the students were frequent binge drinkers, occasional binge drinkers, or never binge drinkers. And the row variable is whether they got into trouble with police over their drinking. So we have trouble with police or no trouble with police. And if we break this down a little bit, we can see that for frequent binge drinkers, if we took 398, the number that had got into trouble with the police over their drinking, over the total number of frequent binge drinkers, this works out to 12.7%. 12.7% of frequent binge drinkers had gotten in trouble with police over their drinking at some point. Among those who are occasional binge drinkers, 5.2% had gotten into trouble with police over their drinking at some point, and those who never had binge drinking episodes, only 1.4% had gotten into trouble with police over their drinking at some point. Visually, it looks like those who had frequent binge drinking episodes are more likely to get into trouble with the police, and possibly the occasional binge drinkers are more likely to get in trouble with the police than those who never had binge drinking episodes. But does this sample provide strong evidence of a relationship between binge drinking and getting into trouble with the police? We're going to test the null hypothesis that binge drinking and trouble with police are independent variables against the alternative hypothesis that that is not true, that those two variables are not independent. We have to be a little bit careful in chi-square tests for two-way tables in that these hypotheses are sometimes phrased a little bit differently. Overall, our null hypothesis is simply going to be that there's no relationship between the row and column variables, and very often we phrase that in terms of independence, but sometimes it is phrased a little bit differently depending on the sampling design. To test this null hypothesis, we're going to use our usual chi-square test statistic, where for each cell we take the observed count, the count we see in the sample, and then we subtract what we would expect to get on average if the null hypothesis were true, we square that quantity, we divide by the expected count, and then we add that up over all cells. For two-way tables, the expected count in a cell is equal to the row total times the column total divided by the overall total. In this video, I'm going to take that as a given, but if you want to know why that is the case, I go into that in greater detail in my text. If the null hypothesis is true, for large sample sizes, this test statistic will have approximately a chi-square distribution, with the degrees of freedom equal to the number of rows minus 1 times the number of columns minus 1. If we take another look at this test statistic, we'd see that when the observed counts are close to the expected counts, this test statistic is going to be small. And when the observed counts are very different from the expected counts, then this test statistic is going to be large. And so large values of the test statistic give evidence against the null hypothesis. After we calculate our chi-square test statistic, we're going to want to find a p-value. So we're going to go to the chi-square distribution with the appropriate degrees of freedom, and we're going to put in our uh, observed value of our chi-square test statistic. The greater the value of the test statistic, the greater the evidence against the null hypothesis. And so the p-value is going to be the area to the right of our test statistic under a chi-square distribution with the appropriate degrees of freedom. Here's our sample data once again, and I've put in the column totals and the row totals. Let's work out a couple of those expected counts. Suppose we want the expected count for this cell. Well, up here we want the row total, which is 623, 
and we're going to multiply that by the column total, which is 5,063, and we divide by our overall total, 11,160, and that works out to 282.6. I'm rounding to one decimal place here, but you should carry many decimal places throughout your calculations. If the null hypothesis were true, we would expect to see on average 282.6 observations in that cell, but we only saw 71 in this particular sample. Suppose we want an expected count down here. Let's do one more. Suppose we want the expected count for that cell. We take the row total, which in this case is 10,537. We multiply that by the column total of 3,135, and we divide again by our overall total of 11,160. And this works out to 2,960.0. To get our chi-square test statistic, we'd first have to get the expected counts for all of the cells in this manner. I've gone ahead and done that. And here, in brackets, I have the expected count for each of the cells. Now we want to calculate our chi-square test statistic. So let's look at this cell. And down here, we take our observed value of 71, what we saw in the sample. We subtract the expected count under the null hypothesis, that 282.6 that we figured out. We square that and divide by the expected count. We do that for all six of these cells. So we do that for all six of these cells, and if we were to do that, we would get a chi-square value of 469.6. Now we need to get the corresponding p-value. But first we need to find the degrees of freedom. And the degrees of freedom are the number of rows minus 1. Here we had two rows, so 2 minus 1 times the number of columns minus 1. We had three columns, so 3 minus 1. So we have two degrees of freedom in this case. Here's the probability density function of the chi-square distribution with two degrees of freedom. When the degrees of freedom are greater than two, the PDF is increasing at first and then decreasing, but for two degrees of freedom it looks like this. And what we're trying to find is the area under this curve to the right of our observed value of our test statistic, which is 469.6. And as we can see, that value is way, 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 way off the screen to the right. And so the area to the right of that value is going to be tiny, very, 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 very close to zero. These calculations were a bit of a pain to carry out by hand. So we usually use statistical software to carry them out for us. Let's see what some of that output looks like. Here's the output from the statistical software R. Here we have our chi-square test statistic, the degrees of freedom, and this p-value. So R is telling us that the p-value is less than 2.2 times 10 to the negative 16, which is just R's way of telling us that the p-value is very, very, very close to zero. So the p-value is tiny, very close to zero. So we have very, very strong evidence against the null hypothesis. But what does that mean in the context of this problem? Well, here we're testing the null hypothesis that binge drinking and trouble with police are independent variables. So we have very strong evidence against this null hypothesis. And there is extremely strong evidence that binge drinking and trouble with police are not independent variables. Going back to the data, the chi-square test is telling us that there is very strong evidence that this column variable of binge drinking is not independent of this row variable of trouble with police. There is very strong evidence that there is a relationship of some nature, that they are not independent. The chi-square test does not tell us the nature of the relationship, just that there is strong evidence that a relationship exists. This can be somewhat problematic if we have a very large table, so 40 rows and 30 columns, say, because it can be a little bit tricky to find out what that relationship actually is. Here it's not so bad. Here it looks like those who participate in binge drinking more frequently are more likely to get into trouble with police over that drinking at some point. We could investigate this a little bit more formally 
by looking at these pairwise comparisons, comparing never to occasional and never to frequent, say, and occasional to frequent, so we could look at that a little bit more formally. But for now, loosely, it certainly looks as though those who participate in binge drinking more frequently are more likely to get into trouble with police. And you might be thinking, quite reasonably, that, well, this is pretty obvious and we didn't need a study to tell us this. But if we always simply assumed that our intuition was correct, we'd be missing out on some very interesting things in this world. So with that, with um, the reader, the speaker from that video just ending on the fact that the chi-square analysis can point out some obvious information, but it also can point out some not so obvious information that is a helpful statistic. Um, this week for your homework, it's a discussion post. I want you to find a journal, journal article that utilizes a chi-square that can be in either one or two way in its analysis. I want you to summarize the study, explain how it used the chi-square, state its null and research hypotheses, and then tell us which was accepted based on the alpha significance level. Please also download the journal article PDF and upload it to the discussion post as well and respond to one classmate. The point of this is that um, parametric statistics are used a lot more often. We like to use them more as researchers. However, non-parametric statistics such as the chi-square is still valuable and I want you to show us how it's been used in an article before um, so we can learn how um, researchers use it to be able to explain relationships. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.